In the last video in this series, we explored aluminum copper alloys, and the results were pretty good. We saw some really big crystals, and even a pseudo Wiedmannstatten pattern. However, there was a lot lacking from this material. Uh, for one, you couldn't etch it, at least effectively, and two, it's extremely brittle, so nothing could be made out of it. So in this video, we're going to be working with a new material system where we can hopefully get a material that's much more workable and has some even better Wiedmannstatten patterns. So let's refresh ourselves on the formation of Wiedmannstatten in meteorites. This structure forms as a solid state phase transformation from taonite to kamacite. Iron nickel asteroids at high temperatures are almost all taonite. But as they cool down very slowly, the solubility of nickel in taonite decreases. So the nickel precipitates out in a new phase called kamacite. Now, if we're cooling slowly enough, this kamacite can grow in preferential growth directions. And thus, we get a beautiful Wiedmannstatten pattern. So let's take this knowledge and apply it to a phase diagram of a different material system. That is the copper-zinc material system. And let's take a closer look at this specific region right here. There are two things that I'm interested in this phase diagram, the alpha phase and the area of coexistence between alpha and beta phase. Upon slow cooling from a melt, single phase alloys can form beautiful dendrites. So that's what I'm interested in the alpha region. Later in the video, we'll go through the mechanism by which these dendrites form in much greater detail. The alpha beta coexistence region interests me because research suggests that beta can have a solid state phase transformation to alpha, just like taonite to kamacite in asteroids. So if I had to pick two compositions on this phase diagram in order to have the best shot at making Wiedmannstatten, or at least a really cool looking microstructure, I would pick an area in the alpha beta coexistence region, say 40% zinc, and an area in the alpha region, say 30% zinc. Going for a relatively high concentration of zinc in the alpha region is going to lead to some more relatively extravagant dendrites when compared to lower concentrations of zinc. And I promise these elusive dendrites will all make sense in time. So let's begin with 30% zinc, 70% copper. Extremely conveniently, I happen to have a big block of this exact composition, so I threw it in the furnace, lit it up, and got to melting. One important thing to note about melting brass is that the boiling point of zinc is right around the melting point of brass. So there's definitely a correct way to melt brass without burning all your zinc. I'm a proponent of the incorrect way, which is stand back and don't breathe in the smoke. After pouring our ingot, we're able to take it, put it back in the furnace, remelt it, and then allow it to cool extremely slowly, relatively speaking, over a period of about eight hours. This slow cooling will allow the dendrites to form more symmetrically as the preferential growth directions are more able to express themselves. And eight hours later, we have a finished ingot ready to grind and polish. Upon closer examination of the ingot, you can actually see some of the dendrites already without even polishing. Those are those little cross-hatched areas. And now normally these features are on the scale of microns, but here they're obviously much bigger, only thanks to that slow cooling. So now that we have our first composition, let's jump back to the phase diagram and get our second composition. We wanted roughly 40% zinc. This concentration puts me comfortably in the middle between the alpha phase and the beta phase. But importantly, it puts me at essentially all beta at high temperatures. This will hopefully allow for this solid state transition from beta to alpha as we cool. So let's get to measuring on this scale illuminated by this beautiful Lichtenberg figure. I'm going for 200 grams of zinc, 300 grams of copper to give me roughly 40% zinc. Now it is essential to spill all the zinc as you put in the furnace and spend a few minutes picking it up. It won't work without that step. And so after adding the copper, all I could hope for is that I didn't get too many zinc fumes. After everything was molten, I actually added a bit of zinc to the melt to try to combat things that were burning off. Although I don't know how successful this was. Anyways, you guys know the drill. After pouring the ingot, we can put it back in the furnace, we can fire up the furnace again to heat things up, and then after everything is nice and hot, we can allow it to slowly cool for about eight hours. And again, eight hours later, we had a finished ingot. So now the obvious next step is to grind and polish until we are left with two ingots with a nice mirror finish. The slightly redder one on the left is the alloy with more copper. 
we're expecting dendrites from this one. And the one on the right has more zinc. We're expecting Wiedmannstatin from this. So unlike the last material we worked with, these features are not visible just after polishing. We actually have to etch the material to see these features. So I etched both the ingots and some ferric chloride. After doing this, the results were quite impressive. This is the alpha beta coexistence material and it looks extremely close to Wiedmannstatin. Under a macro lens, we can see this even better. The raised regions are the alpha phase, which precipitated out from the beta phase upon cooling, which is the depressed regions. The alpha phase is raised because ferric chloride is etching the phase with more zinc composition. So beta is etched much faster than alpha. So our first etched material looks great. Now let's check out the second one. Now these dendrites definitely aren't Wiedmannstein, but I think they definitely look super cool, especially as someone that's interested in microstructures as I am. And again, here they are under a macro lens. So then let's talk about how this structure forms. Let's imagine that I remelted this metal. And so I have a bulk liquid composition of 30% zinc, 70% copper. And so then let's imagine I started cooling this liquid. So things start to solidify. The first solid to solidify is actually not going to be 30% zinc, 70% copper. It may be something like 20% zinc, 80% copper. So why is the composition of this solid different than the composition of the liquid? because the melting point of copper is much higher than that of zinc. So a material with more copper is going to have a higher melting point or a higher solidification temperature. So this composition is more thermodynamically driven to solidify first. However, in order to achieve this higher copper concentration, as the liquid is solidifying, it needs to eject zinc into the surrounding liquid. This leads to a local zinc enriched liquid directly around the solid. This results in each consecutive layer of solid to solidify being still higher than the bulk liquid, but slightly less high in copper than the last one. So the core of the solid is going to have the highest copper concentration and the exterior of the solid is going to have the lowest copper concentration. Also notice that the bulk liquid composition is changing. As more zinc is expelled from the solid into the liquid, it's making a bigger and bigger difference in the actual liquid composition. So now let's take a closer look at this region here and zoom in on those layers in that zinc layer. You can see we have our copper rich core, our slightly less copper rich exterior layer, and our zinc rich liquid. However, this liquid is less like a solid boundary and more like a gradient because as zinc is expelled from the solid, it mixes with the surrounding solution. So let's draw a graph right on this picture. And on this graph, I'm going to plot zinc concentration. Closer to the solid, we have more zinc and further away from the solid, as the zinc begins to mix with the bulk liquid, we have less zinc. Furthest away from the solid, we have approximately the bulk liquid composition of 30% zinc, 70% copper. So we have a gradient of composition. Now I'm going to overlay on this plot the solidification temperature of each of those compositions. That looks something like this. You can see when our liquid has more zinc, it has a lower solidification temperature. And when our liquid has less zinc, it has a higher solidification temperature. So this gradient in solidification temperature has a lot of implications for these little bumps and grooves that exists on the solid. And it essentially means that this bump is going to solidify first and faster than this bump because the tip of the bigger bump exists in a liquid that has a higher solidification temperature. So it's going to be thermodynamically driven to solidify first and faster. And as it solidifies, it's going to push into a liquid that has an even higher solidification temperature, and it's going to solidify faster and faster. And eventually, it's going to form its own zinc-rich liquid zone, and it's going to produce its own dendrites that shoot out from it by the same mechanism. And so when we apply this principle to the main solidifying body, these dendritic structures are formed, all with a higher copper concentration than the surrounding liquid. And it's not just one of these dendrites that form, it's a lot of them. And in each grain, these dendrites are going to grow in a preferential direction. And so from grain to grain, the direction of these dendrites is going to change. So eventually we reach a point where the bulk liquid, which is now enriched in zinc, is going to completely solidify. And now we can take advantage of this zinc concentration gradient by etching the material. Ferric chloride will preferentially attack brass with more zinc in it. So the interdendritic regions are going to be etched much faster than the dendrites themselves. But the dendrites will still be etched, especially the outer layers. Because remember, the core is the highest in copper and it decreases from there. This is why the dendrites look kind of blurry and not completely sharp interfaces. So thanks for sticking around for this long-winded explanation, but let's get back to the material. I have two different materials, a dendritic brass and a brass that looks an awful lot like Wiedmannstein, and they're both pretty workable. 
So I want to turn one of them into a ring. And I decided on going with the dendritic brass. And that's really because the feature size on the alpha beta brass with the Wiedmannstatten is just so small. I feel if I cooled even slower, I could get this Wiedmannstatten pattern much bigger. But for that, I would need an electric furnace, which I guess will be my next big purchase. So anyways, I began drilling a few holes in the ingot to start off the ring. After that, I cut the ingot into pieces to separate the holes. And I started grinding the holes away to shape it into the shape I wanted and did some final manual sanding and employed my 3D printer and my drill to do some janky stuff. Although I feel like this is innovation at its finest. I used this setup to polish the interior and the exterior of the ring. And when it was done, it looked like a normal, very thick brass ring. But after etching, it looks like a metallurgist's ring. Regrettably, I didn't make the ring to fit me. I made it to prove a point. So maybe on the next material, I'll actually design it to fit me. But yeah, this material I would consider a success. We successfully produced what really, really looks like Wiedmannstatten and a material that is workable. I still have some of the cut ingot from the Alpha Brass and the Alpha Beta Brass. And so if you really like this content and you buy a Lichtenberg from our Etsy shop and you send us a message, I'll send out one of these ingot slices with a polished and etched face along with your Lichtenberg. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time with the next material system.